Have you ever felt like you're being a pain in the ass? <laughs> Or have you ever been called difficult? When you're a little girl, difficult looks like raising your hand in class because you know the answer, refusing to wear a dress so that you can climb a tree, or beating a boy in a foot race. When you're a woman, difficult looks like being outspoken or assertive at work, refusing to get married or have children by a certain age or at all, or wanting to be president of the United States of America. <laughs> by definition, difficult means not easy to deal with or to manage. Characterized by causing hardship or problems, a difficult person makes a fuss for no reason. She's unreasonable, or perhaps wants what no person of her race, age, gender, or ability has ever asked for or pursued before. I recently published my first book, a memoir entitled "Born Bright: A Young Girl's Journey from Nothing to Something in America." The book is deeply personal. After some thought, I decided to dedicate the book to all the teachers I could remember that had helped me along the way. I wrote to one of those teachers, a former male professor in my political science PhD program, to let him know that I dedicated the book to him and to ask if he still remembered me. He promptly wrote back and responded, "Yes, I do." You weren't the easiest graduate student to work with, <laughs> but still one of the best. Now I'm 100% certain that he meant this as a compliment, <laughs> but I shut my computer and sobbed. In that moment, I was transported back to that small classroom on that palatial campus. All the angst and uncertainty I had felt those many years ago came flooding back. I was one of two black women accepted into the program that year, out of 11 admitted. The other woman, my new friend, dropped out of the program after our first semester, saying she just couldn't take it anymore. The invisibility, the feeling of not belonging. Although I committed to staying the course, what I soon realized was that there was very little space for me there in the program. There was a way of doing things. And I was doing and saying all the wrong things, like asking, "What about women? What about race? What about poverty?" I was told matter-of-factly that those things didn't matter to the political process. And when I insisted that those things did in fact matter, eyes rolled and my peers avoided me like the plague. In a meeting with the chair of my department, I was told that I needed a team. You're not going to survive here without a team," he said. <laughs>、um, the only problem was, no one wanted me on their team. There was no room for me at the table. I felt as though I was asking for too much, or that I just didn't get it. Something was wrong with me. I was being difficult. In the end, I finished the program. Graduating at the top of my class, after I pecked out a second email thanking my professor for remembering me, I began to wonder whether or not being difficult was such a bad thing. I began to ask myself, what does it really mean to be difficult? I decided that difficult means to disrupt the expectations of others, to ask for more than what's being offered, and to take the road said to be close to me. Instead of seeing being difficult as something I should overcome, I decided to embrace it as a gift. <laughs> Perhaps this gift, as I've now taken to calling it, is the secret sauce of kick-ass women, from Wilma Mankiller to Oprah Winfrey to Ruth Bader Ginsburg and many others, in a male-dominated world that's bent on reminding us in subtle but sure ways of our place in society. I also figured out <laughs> that for most, if not all, of my life, I've been difficult. <laughs>
I'm going to talk to you today about three kinds of disruption or difficultness that I've seen in the world and that have helped me to be who I am. The first disruption is the disruption of dominant, powerful narratives. What are narratives? They're the stories that we tell about others and ourselves and about how the world works. Sometimes they can be harmful stereotypes like all black men are dangerous, all Latinos are undocumented immigrants, or all whites are well off. These stories carry power and meaning in our society. Disrupting the dominant narrative is not easy. Often there's a rush to tap down the new story or to discredit it. Why? Because it's at odds with the story we all have an investment in believing. One of the most powerful narratives we have in our society is that of the American dream. It's the idea that regardless of where you begin in life, if you work hard enough, you'll make it to the top. If you don't, it's because you didn't try hard enough. Our ability to succeed in society is much less determined by our grit or determination than it is by our zip code or the families we were born into. I know this firsthand. Growing up in my neighborhood, I knew kids much smarter than me that never made it to college. Not because they didn't try hard enough or because they did bad things, but because they lacked the access to information and resources or attended low-quality schools. I also lived next door to families that worked 40 or more hours per week that never seemed to make ends meet. I believe these stories were missing from the dominant narrative on poverty and prosperity in our country. We must stop telling stories that aren't true, or at the very least, incomplete. Taking the time to tell richer, more complex stories about others in our society will allow us to connect more fully and authentically to those around us. We can encourage the disruption of dominant narratives by becoming better listeners and by allowing the voices and the experiences of the most vulnerable among us to shape our worldview and our sense of justice and fairness. The second kind of disruption I want to talk to you about is the courage to disrupt the rules and the status quo. About two years ago, I became the coach of my children's soccer team. At the, time, <laughs> at the time, I was the only woman coach in our division. I know what you're wondering, and the answer is no. I have never played soccer before in my life. <laughs> before each game, it's customary to greet the other coach to go over the rules. On occasion, when I would walk out onto the field, the other coach would like, look over my head and ask, Where's the coach for the other team? I can't seem to find him. I'm like, it's me. I'm the coach, I would say calmly. And so, <laughs> Inside, though, I was seething and vowed when we w walked back to our respective sidelines to kick some kitty soccer ass. <laughs> And we did. <laughs> we were undefeated, and chaos soon ensued. <laughs> Once, a coach requested that we switch guideposts, goalposts. He said, the field was slanted, giving us an unfair advantage. <laughs> Although I doubted the science on that, I agreed. Um, another time, we reported to the league for excessive scoring. <laughs> Up to that point, there seemed to be an unspoken rule that only men coached, even if they too had never played soccer. I, wanted, I decided to become a coach because I wanted little girls and other moms to see me and to know that it was, only, it was not only possible to play, but to lead a team. For the most part, the rules that govern our society were not made for or created by women, people of color, LGBTQ individuals, or the, or, economically or the economically vulnerable. They were created by a small group of property-owning white men a long, long time ago. What does that mean in terms of disruption or being difficult? 
It means that when women, blacks, Latinos, gays, or others challenge the rules, protest, demand a seat at the table, or for rights long denied, they're considered difficult or to be asking for too much. It also creates a disruption to the status quo and to the way things have always been done. Sometimes the disruption can be as small as the change from Mrs. to Miss, or as significant and life-altering as the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the passage of Title IX in 1972, or the legalization of same-sex marriage in 2015. This kind of disruption is the most urgent and necessary. It's rooted in our shared humanity and the fulfillment of our human potential. When the doors swing open for those who have been long denied access and opportunity, magic and history happens. The last disruption that I want to talk to you about is the disruption of the expectations and limitations placed upon us by society or others. Did you know that less than 4% of those born into poverty will ever make it to the very top? And only about one in four will ever reach the middle class. For many, regardless of race, overcoming, overcoming poverty is akin to winning the lottery. As a brown-skinned girl born to a teenage mother in Los Angeles, California, the expectations for my life were carved out before I could ever expect, begin to imagine what I might want for myself. <laughs> I believe this is true for all children, including those born into privilege. Our environment, our homes, our schools, our communities, and our daily interactions with the outside world sig signal to us what we can expect to become and how far we can go in life. The bar for my success was low. No one in my family had ever finished high school, and because we were poor, I did not expect much more than I already had, which, to be honest, was very little. It was assumed that I was going to become a domestic worker in one of the mega hotels in Las Vegas like my grandmother, or a school bus driver like my mom, or a hairdresser. And while all these, job, all these were considered good jobs in my neighborhood, it's safe to say that none of them would lead to a solid middle-class life with a comfortable retirement package and enough to pay college tuition for my seven-year-old twins. I was expected to become what I saw and not aim higher. However, I had a different vision for myself, one bigger, and that would require the disruption of the expectations and the limiting stigmas placed upon black, poor, poor people, blacks, and girls in our society. And the biggest one yet, what I could become in life. Had I not had the courage to disrupt or to be difficult, I wouldn't be standing here before you today. So, you see, being difficult is a gift. It's not only a gift to, those, to the person who's pushing the boundaries or stepping more fully into her power or potential, but to all of us, because disruption creates progress. Now, let's all go out there and be difficult. Thank <laughs> you.